came out to one of my favorite sunrise spots this morning because not only did I want to experience the sunrise, but I wanted to experience the sunrise with you. Today I've come out here to answer the questions that you posted on a post of mine a couple of weeks ago where you were interested in some personal things about my life or the channel or where we're going or what we're doing. And uh, so I hope you'll stick around. Today is that day. So I copied those comments and put them into my phone, so I'll be reading them from the phone. I did not bother uh, putting the names of the people who asked the questions. If you hear yours, thank you for posting it. I think I may have just included all of them rather than picking and choosing, so your question's probably in here. The first one is, would you ever consider leading tours? You seem to like traveling and you enjoy photography and you're very good at explaining and storytelling. Plus, you have a calm, kind demeanor. Thank you very much. And seem like you're, uh, you would be fun to hang with. Something to think about. Uh, no, I have not thought about leading tours. <laughs> um, you know, I sort of did that with my family when we went to Scotland. It was kind of like leading a tour. And, you know, it was, it was just very nerve-wracking to try to make sure that everybody had a good time, that everybody saw what they wanted to see. Uh, I can't imagine doing that for complete strangers. And honestly, as an introvert, I don't like being around people I don't know for very long. So probably the, the closest I will ever come is leading you on a tour by video, which I hope to do on some of my travels. To, and one of the things I'm using the uh, Life in Motion Diaries channel for is to learn how to make those kinds of travel videos that are more engaging than just putting a camera up in front of my face and talking to you while I'm at some place. Uh, let's see. Have Ruby help you tell a story about her childhood and then about her children's childhood? You know, this is actually something I've talked to her about um, because I would love to have sort of an interview with my mom on camera, maybe more than one. Um, but especially about her childhood, you know, she grew up in a fairly large family and they had a fairly small house. She grew up on a farm. She grew up with nothing. Um, and I just think that, you know, the stories of her childhood, school days, how she met my dad, early days of marriage, raising kids in the 50s and 60s. I think all that ties very much into the, you know, leaving a legacy for my own kids and for myself. Because it's amazing to me, when we sit down to talk, it's amazing to me the number of stories I hear, if not for the very first time, it's the very first time I was paying attention to them. And it feels like the first time. And I've learned so much about my mom since moving in with her that, um, you know, it's, it's just been an amazing ride. So thank you for asking. This is on my mind. Would love to hear more about your book and how it's coming along and when can we expect more. Was very intrigued reading the first teaser you shared. Your writing style is great. Plus, I love hearing about St. Francis. The book is coming along slowly. I've sort of uh, hamstrung myself by taking on a lot of YouTube responsibility with the Life in Motion Diaries channel, making a video every day. However, uh, having said that, I still have a lot of downtime where I am just sitting on the couch and letting my mind rot in front of the TV <laughs> when I could be writing. And so I, I need to get back to that. I, my goal is to have it done this year. Now, by done, I mean the writing done, and then it would have to be edited. I'd have to have a book cover designed. I, I do want to sort of do a self print, maybe on Amazon, you know, just basically sell it through this channel. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but thank you for thinking about the book and thank you for the compliment. I have had, not necessarily in this post, but I have had a lot of suggestions from my video about my apartment that I want to address. A lot of suggestions about one thing. And that is my dad's chair. 
I've had a lot of people suggest building a base to put under it or getting longer legs to put under it. And, and here's the thing. I have done that. I have put not longer legs, but I have bought like risers that you might put under bed posts and put under the legs and under the under the ottoman's legs to raise it up about six or eight inches. The problem is, let me put my coffee down, the problem is that the back of the seat goes down so far that no matter what you do, the chair is still just not comfortable to me. It might be comfortable to other people. And my grandkids sit in the chair when they come over or they'll sit on the ottoman. It doesn't seem to bother them at all. And it's not like it's not like it's off limits. People are free to sit in it. I've even put some wooden slats under the cushion to keep it from sinking down so low. The problem that I have with changing the legs out, and I addressed this in a comment in an email that somebody sent me about it. And I hope I wasn't, I hope I didn't come across as rude, but the problem is that if I change it out, it's really no longer my dad's chair. And it was never put there for me to sit in. I did make a video about it on my photography channel um, and, and thinking about my dad, but it, it, it wasn't put in the living room to be a useful seat in the living room. It's why the lamp sits over it. It's more of a showpiece in my living room of a sentimental memory that I hang on to every single day. And my middle daughter, Elise, has claimed that chair <laughs> so that when I'm gone, it has a place to go and will continue to live on in the family. But I do appreciate all of the, uh, all of the suggestions. Um, I'd love to know more about your family, children, grand, siblings, parents, also where you've traveled and why. And if you would also show more of your photos or art, that would be fun too. Now there's a lot wrapped up in that question. So, <laughs> uh, as far as my family goes, it was just me and my brother. Uh, my mom came from a family of, I think, seven brothers and sisters counting herself. My dad came from a family of five brothers and sisters. Uh, counting him and you know that they were born they were both born in the early 30s so right after the depression and it was a time when people were farming and a lot of people had larger families um, because the kids could grow up and help on the farm and you know there's a lot of stuff involved there my family my, my parents moved from Arkansas to Illinois very soon after they got married and and left the farm and went into industrial work and, you know, my mom stayed home for a long time, but then she also worked in a canning factory, a Del Monte canning factory for a while. And then she worked in a, in a uh, fabric store for a long time. And so having a lot of children just wasn't in their plans as far as I know. Um, it was just my brother and me, and he was six years older than me. So it was really like they had two firstborn kids because even though I idolized my brother and I tried to spend time with him when I was a kid, he was, you know, he was out with his friends and we didn't do a whole lot of stuff together. As far as my kids go, I've got two children by my first wife, Brittany and Elise, and I've got a child by my second wife, Sarah, and I adopted Sarah when she was 10 and she is mine. There is no, you know, I, I, I say that to, to point out that, um, you know, there was a blended family involved, but I don't treat her like an adopted daughter. She is my daughter. I have five grandkids and they are early 20s down to about 13 now, I think. Uh, it's hard for me to keep up with birthdays and dates. So, um, but I have two granddaughters and three grandsons and they're all just absolutely fantastic human beings. They are all different. They are all unique in their own way, um, and maybe we'll talk about that in a future video. As far as my art goes, or my photography goes, um, you know, maybe we'll talk about that later, but right now it's, it's not of a big importance to me on this particular channel. If you don't mind answering, how old are you? 65. What are some important things about life that you've learned over the years? 
what advice would you give to someone who is newly divorced or newly retired? And if you could do anything over, what would you do and why? You know, I don't have a lot of advice. As far as if you're newly divorced, my advice would be learn to be by yourself. Learn to be happy being by yourself before you jump in being with somebody else. I, I was going through my second divorce before I ever really knew what it was like as an adult to live alone. And that's a long time. Um, I was married at 19. Uh, Our firstborn came along before I turned 20. And I have had somebody in the house with me right up until my mid-40s. And so it's been... um, it's been a long learning process. I wish I had learned that earlier. Not that I would change being married. Both of them gave me a lot of good things in life, especially my kids. But that's the advice I would give is learn to be by yourself a little longer before you traipse off to be with somebody for the rest of your life. What was the other part of that question? Let's see. If I could do anything over. Yes, there is one There's one major event of my life that haunts me even to this day. When I was in the, it must have been the eighth grade because we were living in Marion, Indiana. And my dad bought two tickets for us to go see the Harlem Globetrotters back when Meadowlark Lemon um, was the leader of the group. And I was really excited about that trip. And then I asked him if instead of going with him, if I could take my best friend with me. And my dad, being a dad, said yes. And that's what we did. And I have regretted that request my entire life. There's something you didn't know about me. You said you lived in England for a time. What made you move? Also, how long did you live there? How old were you and your children? Well, we moved to England as part of the Ministry to the Military, uh, which is an arm of ministry in the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. I wanted to go into ministry, and I wanted to go into full-time ministry, and I did not want to pastor a traditional Southern Church of God church. That was never, never on my radar. And so I talked to uh, Bob Moore, who I believe is still in charge of the ministry of the military. And I really only put one caveat, and it's probably a caveat I should have left off. And that was, you know, my kids were, I think maybe 10 and eight, maybe 12 and 10. I don't know, I have to go back and look at a calendar. They were young. But the only caveat I had was I wanted to go to an English-speaking country because I thought they were too old to learn a foreign language easily. The the real problem was I was too old to learn a foreign language easily. And, you know, I kind of wished that we had gone, I hadn't put that in there. We might have gone to someplace like Germany um, where my kids would have been put into German schools and learned a second language in an immersion program. But instead, um, they, had a, they had a situation in Scotland, in Danoon, Scotland, with the submarine tender base there where the, the current director, almost forgot that word, the current director of the Danoon Servicemen Center was actually Scottish. And he was wanting to go to school. And he was going to school um, there in Scotland, but he needed to leave. And so they put my wife, they put my family and I there, knowing that the base was going to close in just a few months. But it was sort of a a stopgap measure for the base. And uh, so we, we lived there for six months. And I learned a lot about working with other denominations and working with uh, chaplains in the in the military and a lot of other things. And then you know, we were kind of wondering what's going to happen when this base closes and where we're going to go. There were still some other bases available in the UK, 
And in Mildenhall, the servicemen center director there, his wife developed breast cancer and wanted to go back to the States for treatment. And so um, they sent us down to Mildenhall. We lived there for four and a half years before we finally came home. Um, do you regret anything you decluttered? Have you repurchased anything you got rid of? How is your mom? Would you consider doing a cooking or baking segment with her? The only thing I, I've got, I've got boats coming in now because the sun's coming up. The only thing I really regret is getting rid of a cast iron skillet by throwing it away rather than taking it somewhere to donate it because I still get comments on that video <laughs> today telling me what an awful thing that was. Um, so I kind of regret that. I didn't want the skillet, but I shouldn't have thrown it away. Uh, my mom is doing pretty good. She's 91. She'll be 92 this year. Um, she gets around really well. And I've, I've talked about in the apartment video that, you know, I, I don't really take care of her. I do some things for her, but she's perfectly able to take care of herself. And as far as doing a cooking or baking segment with her, no. Uh, I'm afraid two people in the kitchen is not my thing. So uh, that's not on my radar. Uh, anything you care to share about the car camper adventure? I was shocked how many of us there were interested in at least part-time car camping. Me too. I was, I was equally shocked. Um, so I have picked up a little more equipment. I have a crate coming in that I've ordered. It will be here this week. I bought a two burner camping stove, but I'm going to replace that with something that packs a little smaller. And uh, I'm hoping in the next week or two to actually make that camping trip happen. So uh, keep, keep watching the channel. I'm, I'm gonna do a one night stay close to home just to try it all out and see what I've forgotten. <laughs> and we'll kind of go from there. Favorite books you've read and what genres you read. So growing up, I read um, things like Agatha Christie, um, Nancy Drew, uh, other kind of, you know, murder mystery kind of books. Gravitated to that in television programs as well. Probably my favorite books as far as uh, Christian books go, it would be The Return of the Prodigal by Henry Nouwen. I think that's the correct title. And A Long Obedience in the Same Direction by Eugene Peterson. Those are probably my two top favorite. As far as non-Christian goes, I, I have always been a lover of Kurt Vonnegut Jr. And uh, Slaughterhouse-Five is right up there among my favorites. And in the eighth grade, we read S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders, which was just a fantastic book, and it's, it still remains one of my favorites. Uh, have you ever lived in any other state aside from Tennessee, as well as outside besides Scotland? Well, I've already talked about Scotland and the UK. But yes, um, I was born in Marion, Indiana. We moved to Rochelle, Illinois. Then I lived in Richmond, Indiana. Then back to Marion, Indiana. Then Bennettsville, South Carolina. Then went Arkansas. Then Cleveland, Tennessee. Then Florida. And then back to Cleveland and now Chattanooga. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, if you have nothing planned for the day, what do you like to do in your free time? I take naps. <laughs> Uh, right now, I am uh, watching the entire series of The Mentalist on Hulu. I have a few shows that I watch that are newer than that, but that's kind of what I'm doing at the moment. After teaching some years, ever keep in touch with students after graduation, any that had surprising careers? I don't necessarily keep up with them um, because I didn't actually live, especially in high school, I didn't live anywhere near them. Uh, but I have run into a few. I ran into a couple of students who were in my middle school classes. I had one who uh, was probably the absolute best writer I've ever come across in my eighth grade class. Uh, she followed me for a time on Facebook and let me know that she thought I was her favorite teacher, um, which I thought really she didn't like me that much. <laughs> but I have run into a few. Um, and some of them, yes, they surprised me at how well their lives turned out given their circumstances growing up. Uh, I'm curious about living with your mom and the adjustments that had to be made. Well, 
you know, I don't technically live with her. I live in the same house with her. So I have my own separate apartment. She's not able to come down the stairs any longer. So if, you know, I go upstairs to visit with her two or three times a day, uh, usually a couple times a day. But for the most part, I'm still sort of living my own thing and doing my own my own thing every day. So I really haven't had to make any adjustments except uh, the furniture that I've changed out. If you could do everything over again and retain your memories and your experiences from this lifetime, what other career would you choose to engage in if given the choice? Wow, that is one tough question. If I had the ability and the talent, I would probably like to have been a National Geographic photographer. I am not that good. Um, I will never be that good, but I think traveling the world over to take amazing photography would be just an awesome way to live. What grades did you teach and administrate? How, was your, how long was your career in education? I was in education for 23 years. I taught seventh and eighth grade English for a time. I was in charge of five computer labs at our middle school. We put every single student through a computer lab every year. So sixth grade did math, the seventh grade did English, and the eighth grade did math again in the computer labs. So I ran those for a couple of years. And then I became um, a secondary tech coach for the two high schools and two middle schools in our district. And then I took on a job being an assistant principal at the Ellen STEM Academy, and I was there for just over six years. And then I went to uh, Fulton High School where I, th I think I was there about seven years. And th those are both high schools and, and they were just absolutely wonderful experiences, both of them. Do you think reflecting on life in your senior year, satisfactions and regrets has its place? Yes, definitely. Reflection always has its place, but I would caution not to spend a lot of time on the regrets. That's nothing you can do about them at this point. So. The, the vast majority of your time should be spent thinking about what you really loved about the life you've lived. Running three channels seems like a lot of work. What was the thinking behind that and how will you manage the content between the three? Did you make being a YouTuber a new full-time job now that you're retired? Well, yes, I have, sort of. <laughs> that was not my intention. I've had my photography channel for 10 or 11 years. And it went through various iterations of different kinds of things on the channel until I finally settled on keeping it as a photography channel. And when I started the, the New Retired Me channel, uh, it was never my intention to go viral or to have almost you know, 47,000 subscribers at this point. That was not on my radar. And my, my intention was to do two videos a week just to sort of fill up some space and then to back off to one video a week. But after the 35 years of stuff video went viral and people just piled into the channel, <clears throat> I sort of felt an obligation to continue to do two videos a week. The Life in Motion Diaries channel was a last minute thought about how can I make better storytelling videos, not necessarily all the videos on this channel, but if I, for instance, if I'm going to Rome in November, Roman Florence, how can I make those videos much more interesting? What kind of shots do I need to get? How can I edit those together? And I could just go out and practice that on my own and nobody ever see the stuff. But I had a lot of people commenting about, you know, how to get started on YouTube and what would they need to get started on YouTube. And you don't need much of anything. Uh, I could make my entire Life in Motion Diaries videos. I can make all of them for less than $100 in extra equipment other than my phone. I'm trying to add a little extra equipment here and there. But I, but I, 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 I had been watching a series from Casey Neistat if you're not familiar with him, look him up. Um, he is Mr. YouTube. And he did 
I want to say 800, about 860 daily vlogs. Now his his vlogs are much more complicated than mine. And that sounded intriguing to me. And so my thought was make a, make a video channel where I'm shooting some video and then critique that video and then let other people critique the video. And I committed to doing that for a year. After the year, I may still continue to post to that channel once a week to try to make actual storytelling movies without the critique. So that channel is going to continue, but it, it has become rather a full-time job. Um, but I also have to say that that third channel of trying to post every day, it gets me off the couch. It gets me out doing something. And uh, so it, it's a good time occupier in that way. Interested in your ministerial days, which denomination, reason you decided to leave or put on hold. So <clears throat> without going into a whole lot of detail, I've already talked about the fact that I was in the ministry of the military. I had started off before then as an assistant pastor at a really small church down in Florida. And I wanted to go into, I wanted to be the head pastor. And I did not want to be a head pastor at a church in the southern United States. I didn't want the baggage that came with having to keep up with southern denominational traditions. That's not a bad thing. It's just not my thing. So when the ministry of the military became available, I jumped at it because I could sort of start my own way of doing ministry. Like these videos, I have a very teaching style behind the pulpit. You know, I, I, I don't have a typical Pentecostal approach to, to preaching. And uh, my wife and I were going through some hard times and we had decided that we needed to divorce. And uh, we separated while I was still in England and I tried to continue to do the pastoring of the church sort of as a single father of two. That was not fair to my church. It was not fair to my kids. It wasn't really fair to me. It wasn't fair to my soon-to-be ex-wife. And so I made the decision to give it up and come back to the States. And I was promised, this is where it gets ugly, I was promised by several in authority in the church that I would be taken care of. They would find a place for me to minister as I recovered through the divorce and allow me to continue the ministry. And when I got back to the States, none of that happened. And so I don't attend the Church of God anymore. It hurt me more than I can tell you. Both those in authority and friends I had in the church and the pastors I had in the church. It doesn't mean that I've given up being a Christian and it doesn't mean that I am not attempting to be a fully devoted follower of Christ at this point in my life, but I gave up on that denomination. So there we are. Ooh, a reflection of your divorce process. If at all possible, don't do it. In my first marriage, I spent about two years trying to reconcile things that were wrong in the marriage and finally just had to give up. In the second marriage, I didn't spend that long. My wife and I were having some differences and she decided that she needed some time on her own. And so she moved out and I attempted to try to maintain that relationship. She wasn't that interested for a time. And then by the time that she decided maybe she was ready to try to work on the marriage, I had already moved on and I wasn't interested anymore. That separation killed us. Um, and I don't blame that on her. We both agreed that it was the right thing to do at the time, but we also both agreed that it was probably the end of the marriage and we would not recover. So if you're considering divorce, um, I, would, I would consider it very long and hard. It is not a fun process. Um, we didn't argue, we didn't fuss, we didn't fight, we didn't argue about the kids, we didn't argue over property. In both instances, we had a very amicable, easy divorce process, but there are way too many times when it's not that. So 
That's my two cents. Are your children amazed or surprised about your YouTube channels and how smart you really are? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, thanks for hanging with me. I'm going to enjoy another cup of coffee before I go home, and um, we will see you next time.